is this next point that international brachytherapy manufacturers will not manufacture or ship a source to an unauthorised or unlicensed department. So my department, our national licence for our department ran out or expired about two weeks ago. And we, knew, and we knew it was about to expire. We have to renew it every year around about the same time. It just also coincides with the time of year that we're expecting to get a new HDR source. So normally the manufacturers are emailing every second day going, where is your license? Where is your license? Where is your license? And it was my understanding that they wouldn't ship us the source until they'd seen our license. What I learnt last week was the manufacturer won't even start making the source until they know we have um, a valid licence. And I learnt that it takes 28 days to manufacture a source, so that includes creating the brachytherapy source and then obviously ver verifying and measuring it and securely packaging it before it's shipped out. So our source was due to be shipped out on the 28th of July but we did not send our license to the manufacturer until the 3rd of July so that meant our source was not shipped until the 31st of July. Um, so that was something I only learned last week I didn't realize there was this 28 day period where you need to give them your new license. So it's something to be aware of for all of you. And I don't know, different countries may have different periods for their license. So in Australia, it's a one year license period. So every year we go through the same process. And like I said, it always coincides with the time we're expecting a new source shipment. So we got a bit uh, caught out this year, but never again, because I've learned from last week. So also as part of that shipping from the manufacturer to the department, you need an import permit, obviously, so that you can get the source through customs and security once it enters the country. And not only does the department need to be licensed, but the individuals who are going to be using the afterloader also need to be licensed as an individual. So this would be a medical physicist, it would also be the radiation oncologist and any dosimetrists or radiation therapists that access the machine and treat patients with the machine. And generally the licenses are source specific. So you would have a license for certain sources. So it might be for a cobalt source or it might be for a iridium source or whatever source that you use in your department it needs to be specified on your license as well. So as I said, all of the countries have different regulatory bodies with slightly different policies, but these ones that I've just spoken to really are quite universal and required for all countries around the world. So these are just examples of radiation licenses. So this is the license for my department. So you can see it expired, actually expired on the 14th of July. So this was last year's license. And it's just, it's a simple piece of paper. It's nothing fancy, but it's required by, by law. This is just a copy of my personal license. So there are different conditions that are attached to my license. So it's not only for brachytherapy, but also for external being um, diagnostic equipment as well. So I'm sure all of you have something similar in your own departments. If you happen to be advising someone who doesn't have brachytherapy yet and they're thinking of getting it, then obviously this licensing issue needs to be the first thing that needs to be addressed for a brand new department as well. This is just an example of the import permit that we, we have for our sources. So we have an iridium source that comes in. Usually this import permit is filled in by the manufacturer, so it might be Varian or Elector or Bebic or whoever, whatever manufacturer you're dealing with. Sometimes you have to fill it in yourself, but usually the manufacturers are keen to get this source delivered to you, so they often do um, filling in these import permits for you. 
So the next thing I just uh, wanted to talk about was source security. And I know that this was covered in the presentation last week, but it's so important that I thought I may as well reiterate some of the things that were covered last week as well. Again, any local authority, so each country will have different requirements for making sure that any radioactive material is secure from anyone that might want to use it for some form of threat or attack on, on other people. And usually this is audited as part of getting your department license. So what the auditors will look for is things like how is the source transported? So you should only use authorised courier and cargo companies that have experience in handling radioactive material and any staff that are involved in any way with that source transport, be it packing, carrying, loading or receiving. So if your source gets put into a holding facility in your hospital, then the people in that holding facility need to understand the material that, that they're dealing with. And obviously, you know, it's, it's a radioactive source whilst it is in some kind of encapsulation, some kind of shielding, there's still a lot of radiation coming out of it. So it's not something that you put next to your desk and sit there for hours and days. So any staff that has anything to do with the radiation source transport need to be aware of what it is they're carrying. The authorised courier and cargo company issue can be a little bit more difficult. Certainly I've had experience with couriers turning up with a radioactive source sitting on the front seat next to them in the car, completely unsecured. So having great communication with your couriers and, and the cargo companies is really important. So they, they understand the importance of what, what they're doing and the dangers they have in, in carrying radioactive source in their vehicles. So the other things that are audited, there must be, you must be able to secure your source when it's not in clinical use. So in Australia, this is quite a strict criteria. So our afterloader is locked in a cage when we're not using it for treatment. The keys are then locked in another box in a different room, which is only accessed by certain people with another set of keys. Some departments have their, their afterloader physically chained to the, to the inside the room, so it can't be wheeled out. So again, every country will have slightly different requirements, but they, they will all have some form of source security requirements as well. And in addition to the source that's in the afterloader, there also needs to be security for the new source you receive. So as you do a source changeover, there needs to be somewhere secure you can store that new source until it's changed, and also somewhere secure that you can store the old source before it's taken back from the manufacturer. So again, there has to be some kind of safe or locked box system that's appropriately shielded as well to hold the additional sources in the department. So again, this is just a, a notification about the, secure, the, the audit of our security systems that was conducted quite a few years ago now. So any authority or regulatory body should give you some kind of notification that they're going to come and audit you. I don't know many that do a, a random spot check, but, but some may. So you need to be aware that all international authorities have been told to um, audit departments for source security. Something else you need to tell the authorities about is what sources you have on the premises. So in doing in having your import permit, you're sort of telling the authorities, well, we're expecting this source, but once you've physically received it in the department, you need to send them notification that this is the source you have. When you ship your old source back um, to the manufacturer, you also need to tell the authorities that that source has now left the department and where it's intending to go. A lot of departments have, uh, or, th or authorities, give a department a limitation on how much kind of source activity a department is allowed to have on the premises at any one time. So this usually isn't an issue because you only ever have one very hot source and then one sort of 
colder source that you're about to get rid of. There may be issues if you have two hot sources in the department and this and I've experienced this in one of the departments I've worked in where we had an issue not long after a source exchange where the source was contaminated or the yeah the source was contaminated with body fluid due to an issue in one of the applicators so obviously we needed to replace that source so we had a hot source in the afterloader that was contaminated they brought a new hot source in so we had two hot sources in the department we actually had to get written authority to have both hot sources in the department because we were above um, the limit of activity that we were permitted to have on site in the department. So uh, another reason you need to notify the authorities is because we need to be able to trace every source that has ever been in the department. So it's best practice to keep a historical record of all the sources that have been in the department. And this is not only for uh, regulatory reasons, but also it's important you know what patients have been treated with what source, because it may be a year or so down the track, the manufacturer says, oh, we've been making our sources wrong. They're not quite what you thought they were. And you may have to go back and look through your records to find out if any patients have been affected by a source. So it's really important you keep a record of all the sources that the department has ever had passing through the department and whatever patients were treated with that source as well. So this is just an example of the notification that we send to our national regulators when we do a source exchange. So we give the information about the old source and the serial number and the activity, and then the new source that's loaded into the afterloader. So it's just faxed off to the regulators. And then this is just an example of part of our source record keeping. So the serial number, what the reference air camera rate was in the calibration date, when the source was put into the safe. So when it arrived, physically arrived in the department and went into our second safe, the date it was actually installed into the afterloader, the date it was taken out of the afterloader, and then the date it was returned to the manufacturers. So um, it's a pretty simple spreadsheet, but it's useful information for a department to keep. Okay, so we've done all the paperwork, we're licensed, we've got our HDR, our source has arrived and we've recorded it all, and everything's been ticked off. Can we just start commissioning? Yeah. Claire, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Maybe this is a good time to take a quick uh, couple minute break and answer some questions okay. before we transition to this sort of next segment. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions? You can write them in or you can speak out loud or you guys are all muted. So, so give, write us a little question if you, have a, if you have a question. While you guys are writing or thinking about questions, take a couple minutes and just reiterate a couple of points that Claire made. I think she's done a really good job and, and said some very important things. So one thing which I think is unique to a lot of us in the group is that HDR or brachytherapy may be relatively new to the country and the experts in brachytherapy are typically the ones that are on this call right now. So the experts are not going to be the ones in the government, they're not going to be in the radiation regulatory bodies in your, in your government, most likely. Some of you may have um, some, some good physicists, radiation physicists in your government, but a lot of times not. So I think it's also important to point out that you all will be instrumental in assisting your regulatory bodies to do things properly. For now and for future clinics, future physicists, and to ensure that your country is regulated properly. So you may have to assist them and, and teach transportation how to be safe and teach them what's going on or to teach your regulatory bodies why is this important, why is this not important, you know, and teach them how to take maybe even measurements even if they have the equipment. So I think it's a cool thing that you guys really have the power to sort of dictate how regulatory bodies work in your countries. Okay, we have um, a question here. When we are exporting source after usage, 
what must be the permissible surface dose rate? Is there any limit? Um, so again, this will be a country specific, um, the permissible surface dose rate. So in the United States, I think it's, what is it, 22? Um, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this is a, a country, country specific limit. Uh, Claire, you can help me out. I think it would um, be the same on the export as well, just to prevent uh, any contamination. Yes. Yeah. So obviously, when you're exporting the source after usage, the the source the source strength is going to be a lot less than when it was imported into the country. So I suspect I suspect there's not really going to be any issues ever because if they've allowed the source to be transported into the country. I'm sure they'll allow a lower activity source to be exported out of the country. Okay, I got confused with the question. I thought it was the yeah. the wipe test. Sorry. No, no, no. So this is returning a source. So, I mean, you would do a wipe test before you sent the source away to make sure that there wasn't any contamination on the sort of the container that you were sending away. But that would be the same limit as any other wipe test for contamination so but, yeah a couple other quick points so claire mentioned the importance of safety a couple of times and again i'll just reiterate this so when you have loose sources not in your machine so when they've been shipped and they're waiting to be put into the machine or they've been taken out and they're waiting to be shipped back again i'll just reiterate the importance of paying special attention to where these are kept in the loft room, radiation protection room, the last thing you want to do is lose a source. If a cleaner comes in and sees a, some container that thinks it's trash and it gets lost, that's the last thing that you want for your center. So just to reiterate that point of safety. Okay, I think it looks like there are no other questions. So Clara, you can continue on. Okay, I keep going. There's one other uh, challenge which can come up. What if the, in order to get the license, the regulator says that they need information about the source first in order to get the license? So you can get the information from the manufacturer about mm -hmm. the specific sources that you'd be receiving. Mm -hmm. So it would have to be listed, you, you can't list the actual source, if this is your question, you can't list the actual source with a serial number uh, or anything like that of what you'll be accepting. It has to come first in the license, it has to be the, the radioisotope of use, so either a radium 192 or cobalt 60 in our cases, with a certain activity limit that you would put on there, so that those two things would have to be on the license in order to apply um, for a source from the manufacturer. It they couldn't go the the other way around. Uh, and Adine, does does this help answer your question? You can un unmute the microphone if you want to speak. <laughs> Can't see. Uh, sorry, we, we can't hear you. Okay. Okay, if you can uh, type what you said uh, because the audio wasn't working, but I'll make sure that I, I hear what your response is. And uh, in the meantime, we'll, we'll continue with the lecture. Okay, all right, sorry. I'm going very slow. <laughs> okay, so there are a few things that we need to consider before we can actually start the commissioning. So obviously you've got accepting your very first source in the department and checking the afterloader itself to make sure the afterloader doesn't cause any leakage radiation. One of the big things that you need to do is your bunker or your room survey and there are other tests you need to do in terms of checking the radiation safety systems of both the treatment bunker and the after loader itself. 
So that includes those things listed there. And also you need to consider personal radiation safety. So having personal radiation safety put into your radi radiation management plan, having personal dosimeters for the staff that are going to be on the machine and making sure you've got some emergency procedures uh, documented and tested with your staff. Okay, so we've got our afterloader, brand new source, arrives in the department. And there are a few things we need to check before we even think about putting it inside the afterloader. Okay, so these things that the radiation levels on the outside of the source transport container, which is usually like a big white plastic bucket, is what it looks like and also the radiation levels on the outside of the source container itself, which is inside the bucket. You need to make sure that the serial number on the container matches the serial number that is provided with the source certificate. Otherwise, you've got mismatches and you're not gonna know uh, which activity you're supposed to be looking at. You need to make sure that there appears to be no tampering with the plastic source container bucket or the source itself. A lot of these plastic buckets have anti-tamper seals around the edges. So it should, should be obvious whether there's been any tampering with the container itself. Um, but certainly you, you should give it a good inspection. So you need to check that the source serial number as well as the container serial number match the source certificate. So there's two two different things you need to check against the source certificate. And you need to make sure that there's no contamination of the cable or the source by doing the white test that Adam spoke about just before. So I guess the key point of this is you should never accept a source that doesn't match its documentation or is outside radiation level tolerance or is suspected of contamination. So if any of these things aren't right, you need to lock the source in a container, in a sealed cage, and then call the manufacturer. Never ever put it inside the afterloader because you don't know what it is you've got in the container. It, it's really important that, that you don't do that. So just an example, so here's the sort of plastic bucket that generally a source will arrive in. It will have your radiation sticker on there. On the sticker, it will have what's called a transport index. So this is a number basically equal to the dose rate at a metre in millirem per hour. It's usually rounded up just to one decimal place. And I guess maybe this might help answer the question we had before about transporting activity. So that certainly in Australia and in the US, I think it's probably international that the transport index should be less than 0.5. So, and then on the, the, the source container itself, which sits inside the plastic bucket, there'll be another sticker, which will now have the, the model and the serial number of the source that's supposed to be in there. And it will also list the activity and the reference air coma rate and the date, date of measurement. So all of this information on, on the sticker needs to match the source certificate that comes, comes in the container with the source. Okay. So I'm just gonna show you a spreadsheet which I think was sent to all of you a couple of days ago. Um, so I'm just gonna work through a couple of these. So you should have all got a copy um, of this spreadsheet. So you can use this in your own departments. That was sort of the point of sending it to you. Um, so you, you, you can use it yourself, you, yourselves. So up here you would put the, the air camera rate, which is from your calibration certificate. If you wanted to, uh, you could put the activity in Curie. I, th I think it's always printed on the source certificate. I've never seen it not, but there are certainly ways you could convert your air coma rate into 
an activity value. So it's sort of some, some helps given there in those pop-up boxes. One thing that's, that's interesting is the sources we receive come from Europe and the source certificate is always printed in Central European time. And it's really important to note that this is always Central European time, not Central European summertime, even in the summer. So when you're doing your time difference between your certificate, which is in Central European time and your local time, you just need to be a little bit aware of it. It's, it's only an hour difference. So if it's wrong, you know, we're talking about 0.1% really um, difference it's going to make into your overall calculation. So it's not the world's biggest deal, but it's just something that you should be very, that you should be aware of at the time. Obviously, your time should be in a 24-hour clock, so there's no confusion between a.m. and p.m. because often you'll find on your source certificates the calibration time can sometimes be really odd hours can be three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. So don't assume because it says three, three o'clock, that it wasn't 3 a.m. Don't assume it was a p.m. because the time should always be in 24-hour time. So we've also got just some information about uh, survey meters that you should could use, any calibration dates just to make sure that they're within their regulatory calibration schedules and any background readings that those survey meters might give you. The reason you might need two survey meters is because when you're measuring the, the sort of the, the dose rate, I guess, or the, the activity on the outside of your big white plastic bucket, it's going to be pretty high. Um, the readings on the outside of that white plastic bucket are pretty high. But when you want to take a reading, say, on the outside of the afterloader or if you're doing a radiation survey, those readings are going to be really low. So you need to make sure that you either have a survey meter that has an adjustable range so that you can get all the measurements in one survey meter, or you may need to have two survey meters depending on the ranges that you need to, to use. So we need to obviously, you want to confirm that the shipment box isn't damaged. So you, you plastic container doesn't look damaged, the anti-tamper seals haven't been broken. Obviously, it's important that the room that the um, source is housed in has some kind of radiation sign uh, on the door as well. So they're just two um, small radiation safety things. So the, you can get your big plastic bucket and you can see the label is your transport in index, that TI, that's sort of sitting in the middle of that diamond-shaped sticker. And you can take a reading at one metre away from the container and just verify that it's within the reading that you see on the sticker. If the reading is much higher, obviously put the container away and call the manufacturer. So, this, this, so these little triangles here will give you a pop-up box um, just giving you a little bit more information about how actually to perform the measurement, what the tolerances are, what you should do if it's outside of tolerance. So for that particular uh, container measurement. For this, these measurements down here, what we're looking at is the, oops, the highest radiation dose rate, about a centimetre from the surface of the package using your... Uh, serving meter or iron chamber and this is on the outside of the plastic bucket so you, you put your survey meter around the outside of the plastic bucket to get a better reading at one centimeter you will find that different parts of the bucket will give you different readings so around the handles you often get a higher reading just because there's hinges and joins and so there's less shielding uh, in the bucket there so you might find that parts of the bucket you actually get a higher reading. As long as those readings are still within tolerance, that's okay. That's not a problem. And then the last test that we talked about there was the wipe test. So you take some filter paper or some kind of other semi-absorbent material and you wipe down the container, inside the container, outside the container, as long as it's 
the, uh, the previous measurements have indicated it's safe to open the container and then your contamination should be no greater than 22 um, dpm per square centimetre. And that's uh, sort of an international standard, really. So this little pop-up box here will just give you an idea of how to do the test and what to do if the test doesn't pass. So... Claire, there's a quick question from Lucio Castro. The source activity in the label should reflect which date activity? That would be the date of uh, calibration. The date of calibration. Okay, thank you. So, so that would be the date it left the manufacturer because that's obviously when the transport starts, which is usually the date of calibration. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problems. Um, I'm just trying to get all my stuff organized. Okay, so the next thing we need to do, so we've tested our source, we've checked the container, there's no leakage, everything's within tolerance. We've now put our brand new source into our afterloader. So what we need to do now in our brand new afterloader is check that the afterloader itself has been manufactured correctly to ensure that there's no radiation leakage coming from the unit itself. So that the, the radiation safe that's inside the afterloader doesn't have any cracks or holes or that the source is driving appropriately inside into the safe in the afterloader. So obviously there are tolerance limits for the radiation leakage from the afterloader. So if you do this, you have your brand new afterloader, you've put your source in and you find that the afterloader leakage is outside tolerance, you should never ever use this unit clinically. Again, if anything is outside tolerance, you have to put that unit into a secure position um, in a shielded area and contact the manufacturer. So usually when you get a new HDR unit installed um, and the source arrives, one of the engineers from the manufacturer should be on site anyway whilst you're doing all this testing and the acceptance. But if not, if they don't happen to be there, then obviously you put the afterloader into a safe place and you contact the manufacturer. And the afterloader should never be used um, if it has unacceptably high leakage. So we'll just go back to my Excel spreadsheet. And so just at the bottom of the page here, try to scroll through. Oh, sorry, that went fast. So this is just sort of a schematic diagram um, of an afterloader, just the, the, the top of the afterloader, the bottom of the afterloader. The source doesn't live in that part of the afterloader, so there's no need to measure it. Um, again, we take survey meter readings 10 centimetres away from various points around the afterloader and record those and the tolerance should be less than one milliram per hour um, based on international guidelines. So, so they're the, the tests that you do on the source to make sure it's safe and on the afterloader to make sure that it's safe as well. Um, so I'll just go back to this one. And for those on this call who haven't seen a spreadsheet like this before, uh, this is a very useful tool and we've given it to you so that you can use. So please, we're trying to make safety easy. Try using this if you're, if you're using an HDR program right now and, and email us with questions because there will be questions and this will help in the long run. We really do think so. Okay. Um, sorry, I've just looked at the time. I realise I'm going very slow. <laughs> so the next thing you want to do now that you know that your source is uh, okay, it's within tolerance, and that your afterloader is manufactured correctly, we need to make sure that the, the shielding that you've designed and the building that you've made to house this brachytherapy treatment unit actually meets the standard of the design that you've created. So, so we need to test whether the shielding actually installed 
is what you've expected it to be. So again, when you do these measurements, if you find that things are outside of tolerance, there are things that you can do to fix that. So you can add additional shielding if you need to in areas of the bunker. You could change the room design so that you're increasing the distance from any suspected hot areas. Or you could do things like change an uncontrolled area to a controlled area so that people are not allowed into the controlled area during whilst the radiation source is outside of the afterloader and things like that. So again, when you do your survey, if you find things that are wrong, then you need to act on those. You can't, you can't just ignore a high reading. You need, to, you need to resolve it in some way. So again, we've got the, the spreadsheet um, that was sent. Uh, so just on the next tab, we've got our room survey. So again, you put your air kerm strength up here, your activities, your calibration dates and times. And then there's a table down here. A lot of this is automatically calculated. So you only really need to enter the things that are in the blue boxes. The red boxes are automatically calculated in this spreadsheet, just to make life easier. So your maximum air coma rate usually comes from your calibration certificate. You can assume that it's at the same. Ideally, you probably want to correct for decay at the time you're doing the measurements. So that would be the appropriate value to put in there is the decay corrected air kerm rate at the time of measurement. So your, your track, your total reference air kerma value, usually comes from your treatment plans. So obviously if you're a brand new department and you don't have any treatment plans to, to work off a sort of a maximum track value, a, a number of seven is usually um, a pretty, pretty good. It's an overestimation, which is always a, a better thing to do than to underestimate. And the other things you need to mention is how many, how many patients or fractions per day you expect to be treating. So in this case, we've put four fractions per day and how many patients or fractions you can treat in any one hour. So it would be, it would be fairly unrealistic to put any more than two patients in an hour, only because you've got time to set up the patient, connect it up, run the checks on the machine, check the plan before you deliver it, and then the actual time of treatment itself. So two seems to be a, a realistic patient per hour number. But certainly if any of you have experience in your own departments and maybe you can push patients through faster than, <laughs> faster than I can, obviously put in a value that is suitable for your own department. Um, so from there, we can get a dose rate in water. So we're converting our air coma strength to a dose rate in water. So that's just using a value of 1.18, which comes from the mass energy absorption coefficients over density for water to area ratios. So the time per patient is based on the air coma rate and, and the total reference air coma. So it's just those two numbers divided by each other. Um, and then the number of fractions per week and fractions per year are based on the number of fractions per day, um, obviously multiplied. So again, all these treatment times automatically worked out based on the numbers that you put into your spreadsheet. Um, okay. So from there, we've got a sort of sample um, room diagram here. So you, sh you should have a, obviously a copy of your own bunker Floor plan, that's the word I was thinking of. So, and, and all of these measurements in your own bunker floor plan are appropriate. You need to look at every individual wall and how many different spaces there are, like rooms and spaces and cupboards along the walls. You need to think about the roof and also underneath the bunker, if there is space, if you're not on the ground floor, if there's space underneath. So all of these sort of measurements need to be taken. Um, and they'll go into a table here. So the maximum exposure here will be the value that you're getting from your survey meter. It's then automatically corrected to be the maximum dose rate in water. The occupancy factor, I've said here, it's probably best to refer to NCRP 151 for guidance 
on what the occupancy factors should be for the various parts of your of your clinic. I've just put it here. So, you know, obviously an occupancy, occupancy factor of one for any fully occupied areas down to, you know, outdoor or transient pedestrian areas, an occupancy of one over 40. Oh, and I also just put here as well, where do you actually take the measurements with your survey meter? So normally it should be about 30 centimetres from the bunker wall, outside of the bunker wall, usually around about sort of chest waist height. In that instance, if you're looking at a floor above, should be around about half, a, about 50 centimetres from the floor, because people tend to be sitting in those instances. And if you're in the floor below, around about 1.7 metres from floor level, so sort of at, at average head height to take your measurements. So once you've, you've figured out your occupancy factor, the hourly, weekly and yearly equivalent doses will be calculated automatically in this spreadsheet um, based on the, um, the times and the activities of the measurements that you're doing. So there are some dose limits here, but please make sure you refer to your national guidelines as well, because different countries do have slightly different limits. So the US limits one millisievert per year in an uncontrolled area and 50 in a controlled area. Um, however, in Australia, this 50 is actually 20 millisieverts. So different countries will have slightly different different limits. So just make sure you check with your national regulators as to what the dose limits are in your particular country when you're doing the radiation surveys. Um, so again, there's some little pop-up boxes that will help guide you as to, to what each of these things are. Um, and then the equations, obviously, they're not complicated. You can see them, see them up the top as well. So I'm just conscious of time. I don't want to keep you all too long. So I will quickly finish off the presentation. So the last things we really need to think about. So we've done our bunker survey. Everything's good in our bunker. Um, Claire, sorry. Can we just take uh, two minutes just to answer any questions over the, the bunker survey? Because I know that's uh, a new thing for a lot of people and sometimes yeah, it's, 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 it's a, a big uh, a little bit complicated. So if anyone wants to write in questions, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. So, until and just I so you're aware, um, I think we've realized we haven't covered shielding design very well. So I'm actually working on another presentation that will be given at some point in this program that will cover shielding design and we can go back over the bunker surveys as well in that presentation. If, uh, if people need. Very good, very good. And uh, so Claire mentioned at the end about how each country could have specific uh, regulatory limits for personnel or for uncontrolled spaces as well. So look at those for your country and then just keep in mind, keep in mind that you will have to update the Excel sheet uh, to incorporate those values. So those cells that are filled out automatically, they have equations. And if you have a question, questions, you can ask us. We'll be happy to help you adjust the Excel sheet. Um, otherwise, it's quite simple. So when you see something multiplied by the cell for um, 20, just change it to whatever it is for, for your own country. But we'll be happy to help assist any changes due to your difference in regulatory limits. Uh, uh, I've just seen a good question come up about the bunker survey and whether that should be done for every new source. So it does, it, it's not required to be done for every new source as long as the sources you're receiving roughly the same activity, which, which they will be. Even if you receive a source that's of a higher activity, your treatment times will be less, shorter. So it all, it all kind of rounds out in the end. The only time you really need to think maybe about redoing a bunker survey, but probably not even doing the measurements, but just looking at that calculation spreadsheet is if you start to treat a lot more patients than you initially thought you were. So you, you might say, look, we're going to treat five patients a week. Um, and then 
12 months later, you're treating 25 patients a week. Obviously, that, that workload is going to get a lot bigger. So the, the calculations should be reviewed annually to make sure that your, your statistics, your treatment statistics are accurate, but the measurements themselves don't need to be repeated because the measurements won't really change over time unless you change something structurally in the building. So we have another question, which is, uh, how, is ex how are the exposure conditions for a bunker survey? Should the source be exposed in the center of the bunker with no scattering, attenuating material around it? So I think this goes into Claire's answer um, also, that everything that we do with these bunker surveys is for worst case scenario. So like earlier, where the track, a typical track is four and a half, um, we use seven on the Excel sheet, you would typically give um, for your air chroma strength, the highest that's allowed on your license for this calculation, you would typically assume that you're going to, for the calculation, treat more patients than you think you actually will. So everything is worst case scenario. So for this as well, you would do it with the source, not in any scattering material, just the source going into a simple applicator on a table so that it's worst case scenario. Yeah, S same principle as you do for um, doing a bunker survey for a LINAC. Mm -hmm. so you, want, you want the maximum radiation exposure coming through the walls. Okay. I'll, so that one more thing, we continue. The difference between dose in any one hour and instantaneous dose rate. So you'll see some calculations. There's not a, if you just divide uh, the doses from the weekly by uh, 40, you won't get the exact same results for the dose in any one hour. The difference is the dose in any one hour takes out the occupancy factor. So even in a, a corridor or a park outside next to the bunker that may have a really low occupancy factor, say one over 40 for a sidewalk outside or parking lot, a person could theoretically in any one hour throughout the week be standing right there next to the bunker for one hour. So the dose in any one hour does not have the occupancy factor allowed. And also the dose in any one hour is different from instantaneous dose rate. So when you take a measurement with your survey meter, you get some millirem per hour. That is not your dose in any one hour, even though it says millirem per hour, because your, your brachytherapy treatment only takes on the order of five to 10 minutes for a new source. And so you're not going to be, in order for your instantaneous dose rate to be the same as your dose in any one hour, you'd have to treat a patient for one hour straight. The source would have to be out for one hour straight. So that's where the, the workload comes in. So just make sure that there's no confusion. The reading that you get from your survey meter is dose in any one hour, that's instantaneous dose rate. Okay, I think you can continue on, Claire. Thank you. Okay. I'm almost done, so <laughs> please just bear with me for a few more minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, just let me check. I haven't skipped a slide. Okay, we've done that. Okay, so our bunker survey is saying everything's okay. Our source is in the afterloader. So there's a few things we need to check just to make sure that we are safe uh, during the commissioning process. So there needs to be some radiation monitors and indicators in the bunker and in the, the console area. So there should be an independent radiation monitor, or an, so an area monitor, monitor, probably mounted on the wall in the bunker. And this should give you an independent indication of whether the, there is activity inside the room. Some afterloaders have a light on them that is like a, an area monitor. Some don't. It's still worthwhile having an independent radiation monitor um, that's independent of the afterloader completely because if the afterloader malfunctions, it could be that the, the radiation monitor is also malfunctioning. So something completely independent um, to monitor radiation inside the room. Obviously, a beam on light is really important so that people don't walk into the room when the treatment's on. And some kind of, but it's a law in Australia that there needs to be a particular sign 
put inside the treatment room that indicates there is a permanently active source in this room as well. So you, you probably need to check with your regulators as to whether that's required in your specific countries, but that's something that we, we require in Australia. So audio-visual systems are really important. You need to be able to see your patients and hear your patients when they're being treated. The CCTV is also a really, really useful quality assurance tool. We use it a lot to check our source positioning um, on our elector machines. So we kind of zoom our CCTV into our source check ruler and we can see the source position that way. So it's a really useful QA tool as well. So obviously there are a bunch of different interlocks that come that are attached to the afterloader and also to, to the treatment room itself. There should be several emergency stop buttons, both inside the room and outside the room to, to stop and retract the source in case of emergency. There should also be treatment interruption buttons, so a non-emergency button. The difference between having the emergency stop and an interruption is the emergency stop actually retracts the source with quite a physical force, um, a much stronger physical force than an interruption button. So I've been, I've been told by the engineers that you shouldn't hit the emergency stop unless you, unless you need to because it, it puts wear and tear on the cable that the source is attached to. So if it's, if it's a non-emergency, so a non-medical emergency, you just need to stop the treatment, maybe just to make sure your patient's okay, you hit the interrupt button, uh, not the emergency stop. So there should be a door interlock or some kind of interlock that will retract the source if someone walks into the room whilst the source is out. And there should be some kind of interlocks on your transfer tube connections uh, as well, just to make sure that you've got the right transfer tubes connected to the applicator, that they're connected properly. There's no loose connection where the source or the transfer tube could possibly fall off as well. Backup power is really important. So if there's a power outage in the department, there needs to be some kind of backup power system that will retract the source in, in the case of a power outage. So it's usually some kind of battery that's attached. The manufacturers provide the backup power source usually, um, but you need to check that it works. So if there's a power outage, the backup power will retract the source the patient. You need to have a shielded emergency container in the room when you're treating a patient. So that's if the source gets stuck and you need to remove the applicator and the source from the patient, you need to have somewhere safe and shielded to put the applicator um, in an emergency. So usually the manufacturers should provide this when you, when you get an afterloader, but if they don't, it's, it's a necessity. It's something you need to have. So you, you'll have to obtain one somehow. And each afterloader should have a way of manually retracting the source. So you've got your treatment interruption buttons, you've got your emergency stops. If they fail, you need to somehow be able to retract the source out of the patient uh, in the event of an emergency. So all afterloaders will have some kind of handle or winder that you can use to retract the source manually out of the patient if needed. So those, you need to make sure that all those things are in place, that they're all working properly before you can even think about actually starting to commission the afterloader itself. I think this might be my last slide. So just quickly again to highlight that there needs to be some personal radiation safety considerations as well. So you need to have a radiation management plan, which is, which is often required as part of your departmental license to have the afterloader and to get the sources. You should think about, if you don't already have them, some kind of personal dosimeter that goes beyond, you know, the TLD or the film badge that you might wear for three months at a time. An instantaneous readout personal dosimeter is really useful in brachytherapy, particularly if you're going into the room to manually retract a source or help a patient and whether a source is stuck. Um, it, it's important that you know how much dose you're getting at the time, um, not two weeks later when they finally read out a TLD or a film badge. So it's a really important piece of um, equipment that you need to have. Obviously, emergency procedures are really, really important. There's a whole nother presentation dedicated to that, so I won't 
I won't go into it, but you, you do need to make sure that all staff who are involved in any kind of brachytherapy treatments are aware of the emergency procedures and they're refreshed at least annually on what the emergency procedures are. And I think that was it. Oh, so they're just a couple of references. Hopefully the links work on the PowerPoints that you guys were sent. If there are publications that you can't access yourself, please feel free to contact me and I, I can provide those for you as well if, if you can't get access to them in your own departments. Happy to. So and that's it. Sorry, I've gone over. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire. We started, uh, we started a little bit late, so you were almost at an hour. It was very good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I just want to answer a couple questions that were messaged because other people may have uh, the same questions. So one person asked if an ion chamber should be used or a Geiger-Muller based on for survey beaters. So an ion chamber, chamber should be used, a uh, GM counter only detects if radiation is present. Ion chamber um, can actually uh, measure the amount of radiation. And just to keep in mind that uh, ion chambers or ion chamber survey meters should be calibrated once per year. And then another question was, should the emergency, how often should the emergency interlock be checked, considering the fact that it's uh, more wear and tear on the machine? The emergency stop should still be checked every day before you have a treatment. So the wear and tear on the machine is still not as uh, big of an issue as making sure that your emergency stop um, is um, okay to be used on the day of treatment. We cycle through ours. So we have four different emergency stop buttons. And so we cycle through each one. So we don't test all four of them every day. We test one and then the next one the next day and the next one the next day. So we cycle through ours in my department. Very Everyone's good. <laughs> uh, does, does anyone else have any questions? Feel free to message in or... There's one more question about if the source does not retract, what's the procedure? First remove the patient from the room or retract the source first. Okay, that, look, that's a good question. I think that's probably going to be covered in the emergency procedures session. But, you know, the idea is you go and you try and manually retract the source from the patient first. If that doesn't work, then you have to, re you have to remove the applicator from the patient. Yeah, so that, that would be the steps that I think. Very good. Well, thank you again, Claire. And Sorry. everyone, I think it would be a good idea. You have this document now. I think it would be a good time to play with the document now. Uh, if you have questions, about how to use the document, you can email either Claire or myself. We'll be happy to help you out with it. Each I think some of the will... cells are locked. So if you need the password, just, just let, let us know and we can give you the password to unlock cells. Perfect. Because each session will typically give you one or more cell sheet department. So it would be best to stay up to date as we give them to you. You should, I think, take that opportunity to play with them and, and ask us questions. Okay, so next week, I think we have off its Eid holiday, and then we will resume uh, the week after, according to the uh, scheduled uh, Excel sheet that was sent to you with the same, the same Zoom link as we use every week. Okay, so... So I guess we will call it a night. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you again, Claire, for the wonderful presentation.